Perfect. Never found it's recording. All right, I think it's about that time for class. Uh, so I'm just going to get started. Uh, so just a few announcements. Everyone, yeah. 731. I turned on it. I turned on at 730 or whatever. Anyways. Uh, yeah, so lecture eight. So just I have a few announcements. So Monday, I actually have to run out of town because I have a family emergency. So I will not be here. Uh, so lecture will be in Zoom. And then Wednesday will be in person. And so will Friday lecture. So it's one day, basically. Uh, some of you aren't registered in the section, so you probably didn't get the email. So the I have added these to the slides. And uh, if you don't have access to the drive folder where I'm putting the slides, uh, please email me. Uh, you can alternately just write down the numbers. <laughs> you can alternately <laughs> just write down the numbers. <laughs> Yeah, so Monday, 1.30, next, uh, next, next Monday, lecture remote. That's the meeting ID. Uh, and like I said in the previous lecture, for high frequency and low frequency analysis, we're actually ignoring the little omegas. Uh, sorry, we're ignoring little RO or channel length modulation. So we're always going to be assuming lambda equals zero. That's not because... Uh, Lambda is zero, it's because it simplifies the analysis. So it's just to make the computation more simple. And uh, as it turns out for most of these circuits, it actually, channel leg modulation turns out to be quite negligible when you're doing these uh, omega analysis. So if you don't see a little RO in the small signal it's because we're just neglecting it. So we're making an approximation that it's infinite. RO is infinite, little RO is infinite. Okay, so let me get started with today's lecture. But before I do, so I just wanted to talk a little bit more about these uh, output resistance, input resistance, and all of these things. So, because I've been getting a lot of questions. So in particular, if you look closely at all of our uh, MOS amplifier models, they each have an input that looks like this form, B sig and R sig. In the book, the notation is RS and VS. I call it VSIG and RSIG because it's confusing uh, with the RS, because then you can confuse that with the resistor at the source. Uh, whereas the book just decided to add an extra S to the resistor at the source. But I think it's more clear if we call it VSIG and RSIG, meaning that it's your signal coming in and that's the non-ideality associated with it. So all of these have an input model, which consists of a voltage source and a resistor. And then there is an output model, which is basically RL or the load connected to these resistors. And so when we find this capital RO and this capital and this capital RIS or the input resistance and output resistance, what we're really trying to do is find an equivalent Thevenin resistance for this circuit, looking into this terminal, 
while removing the input. So that would be RIS. Uh, and then when we're looking at the RO, we're actually looking at the equivalent Thevenin resistance, looking it to this terminal without considering capital RL. And the reason we're doing that is because the input to the amplifier and the output to the amplifier. Uh, so what you actually like connect to the amplifier as an input and what you connect as an output is not really part of the amplifier. So the actual amplifier is actually what's in between R sig and V sig. So when you buy a toaster, right? The outlet plug is not part of your toaster. You connect the outlet plug to the toaster. And so it would be kind of absurd if the person selling you the toaster would tell you what the resistance is while considering the plug characteristics. Well, essentially, if you consider the plug characteristics, when you're analyzing these things, you're really like saying that the toaster, the plug is part of, or like the wall outlet is part of the, the, the toaster, essentially. And so effectively, we're really always, that's why we're always kind of removing this part of the circuit and this part of the circuit when we're trying to define these equivalent uh, elements. Uh, yeah, in the, in the same way, I guess at the output side, I, I know this is like a tried analogy that I just keep using the same one and same one. If this is your amplifier, the speaker is not part of the amplifier. And so when you're analyzing the amplifier, you don't actually put the speaker into the amplifier analysis. So that's why RL is not included. Uh, I hope that this uh, cleared some questions up because I've been getting this question a lot. Uh, yeah, but if you still have questions, please come to office hours. I will continue repeating myself in different ways. Uh, I realize that we're not all like, I'm a visual learner. You might be more like textual learner. And so we'll figure out how to get you to understand this. Uh, so if you work with me, I'll work with you. Basically, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. OK, so today's topic will be high frequency analysis. So as we said in last lecture, when we're looking at this uh, small signal models, we're really analyzing its behavior at this mid band of frequency where omega is high enough where you can consider all of the capacitors as short. So all of these behave as short, but it's still low enough where you can still neglect the internal capacitances of the MOS circuit. So you can still neglect this capacitance between the gain and the drain and the capacitance between the gate and the source. It, as it turns out, if you keep increasing the frequency, keep increasing the frequency, these capacitors between the gate and the source and the gate and the drain they will start to behave like shorts. And so then the frequency response of the uh, circuit will actually change. And so just to uh, emphasize that, so at the mid frequency, these two capacitors, which are internal to the MOS transistor behave as open. And so that's why you actually never saw these in the small signal model. But if we increase the frequency enough, what will happen is that uh, these will actually have to be incorporated into the model. And eventually, if you have a very, very high frequency, these capacitors themselves will start actually behaving as shorts and this thing will no longer amplify. Uh, just so that uh, to give you kind of an idea of phenomenologically where this arises, well, you have a plate here, a metal plate, and then you have a gap here, and then you have somewhere that charges actually kind of concentrate at the bottom in the red. And so the fact that you have these two parallel plates actually forms a capacitance um, because charges will kind of develop up here. And so you can actually charge these circuits. And so phenomenologically, we can model that kind of uh, behavior as uh, these capacitances that are in series and in parallel. Now, these things tend to be quite small. So 10 to the negative 12 to 10 to the negative 15 farads. So just to give you an idea, if you have an impedance of one over omega C, uh, if C is 10 to the negative 12, and let's say you got a gigahertz signal, so 10 to the nine, your impedance 
is 10 to the negative three. So as you could see, the impedance associated with uh, this particular, oh, sorry, uh, your impedance is, sorry, 10 to the three, not negative three. I saw some eyes and then I realized, yeah, I don't do good math. <laughs> anyway, yeah, it's, it's 10 to the three. So the impedance is still fairly large. So it's about a thousand, well, not that large, but uh, at 10 to the nine. So we're talking about a gigahertz. If you're running this at a megahertz, that's 10 to the six, then the impedance will be 10 to the six. So then it's gonna be one mega ohm. So at low frequencies, these uh, will behave as open basically. Okay, so how are we gonna do the high frequency analysis? And believe it or not, it's uh, similar to before, but not exactly the same. We're still gonna look for Thevenin resistance across each terminal. But now what we're gonna actually do is we're gonna, if we're analyzing the Thevenin resistance across the gate and the source, we're not gonna short CGD, we're actually gonna open it. So when we're doing the low frequency analysis, we always short all other capacitors. In this case, we actually open all other capacitors. That's the only difference between low and high frequency. In low, you short them, in high, you open them. And the reason is because you're actually, you're always thinking about it from this standpoint of the mid frequency model. And so the thing, the, the, from the mid frequency model perspective, if this capacitance stops behaving as an open, this one would remain open. And so that's why you treat the other one as open. Whereas at the low frequency end, if a capa the capacitor that's uh, actually here stops behaving as a short, all others remain as short. And so this kind of me this this gives us the reason for our different strategies. At the low frequency, failing means going from short to open, whereas at the high frequency, failing means going from open to short. And so because where the the behavior changes of capacitors are in the reverse order, we also do the reverse thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, so at high frequencies, you're just gonna take one capacitor, find the Thevenin resistance across it and open the other internal capacitor to the transistor. Yes. So if you go back to that, if you look at the, uh, the drawing, so you don't, the minute you still store the external capacitors, like you don't consider C1, two and three, no, because because at high frequencies they even behave like more short. Okay. It's the, the approximation gets better and better and better and better and better. It doesn't get worse because the impedance will just become, uh, yeah, smaller. Right? Yeah, smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. But the problem is that the impedance of this we're still approximating it as infinity, the internal ones. Eventually, those also will become small. Okay. That's kind of the problem. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, you were saying that like you kind of, you, you short the other capacitor, but you leave one in this second. Well, so so you're you at and when you're looking at high frequency, you're only looking at two capacitances, the one between the gate and the source and the one between the gate and the drain and the drain. Because those were behaving as short, as open in the small signal model. And so what you're doing in this process is you're assuming that one of them fails. So it stops behaving as a uh, open and the other one is still working. And then you find the Thevenin resistance to figure out at what frequency that particular capacitor fails. And then you go to the next capacitor and you do the same thing. So then when, when you say like the same thing, you flip it like the other one short to so the other one you find the Thevenin. Yes, but no, yes. So you flip it, but the other one doesn't short it. Opens, oh, okay. opens, opens. Low frequency short, high frequency open. Yeah. But if you're always looking at this from the mid frequency perspective, then there's no wrong thing because from the mid frequency respect perspective, you're always saying if this capacitor fails, if this capacitor fails, I you're just looking at the Thevenin resistance across this terminal. And then you're saying if this capacitor fails, you're just looking at the Thevenin resistance of this terminal. But you notice that all the other capacitors are already short and these are already open. So when you look at it from the mid frequency, what you're actually just doing is you're just saying, what if my assumption fails for one capacitor? 
when does my assumption fail from the other capacitor? And you're not really doing anything to the circuit. The thing is that we actually have to draw these low frequency ones with all the capacitances. And so that's why we say you short all the other ones. But in reality, you're looking at it from the middle and you're actually just changing one capacitor. Does that make sense? Maybe. Yeah. How would you divide the voltage choice? The, what do you mean? It, it's a dummy variable. So you just call it VX. And then, cause you're gonna solve for the ratio of VX and IX, which is R7. And, and you actually can just find R7 in whatever way you feel like it. I just always use VX, IX as it works, no matter what. Uh, but you're really just looking for R7 and there's no, and the, the reason why I use the VX is because sometimes this dependent source will come into play. And so sometimes just looking at the input terminal resistance is not gonna work. Okay, so there's one last caveat. So it turns out that these uh, capacitances are so close to one another in value that you can no longer just pick the maximum of the two. And omega high is actually just one over the sum of the two. So that's kind of the other caveat that you have to find both of them and then add, take the ratio of them, add it together to get the estimate of omega high. So is that, oh, go ahead. What do you mean by cutoff? Is that the upper bound of the high frequency or lower bound? Yeah, yeah. So this this mid this uh small signal model is valid for a range of frequencies. So if I if I input too slow of a of a of a varying signal, this thing will actually behave will not produce the gains we need because it's going to be very close to the DC model, uh, because it's like varying too slowly. Eventually, I, I kind of decrease the temporal variation of the poles. And now as a result, I actually can uh, generate my, uh, I will actually amplify. But if I keep increasing the frequency of the poles, so if I go to a pulse that looks like this, eventually what will happen is that I will no longer amplify. And so these omega low and omega high represent kind of the minimum width and the maximum width of the, uh, sorry, the maximum width would be omega low and the minimum width of the poles uh, that I can actually amplify. So I, so I guess this is, this is how this would be relevant. Again, going back to my tried example of uh, music. So the audible range goes from 20 Hertz to about 20 kilohertz. So if you take your, if you have your amplifier and this part of free omega low is like one kilohertz, it's just gonna basically not amplify the lower frequencies of the audible range. And so that's gonna, you're gonna get a very different signal than what you'd input in. You're gonna lose all of those low frequency parts of the sound. And so you're gonna be very angry. Uh, and so uh, a lot of people designing these uh, headphones and stuff and speakers, they have to actually make sure that all of their amps and devices work in that range that people can hear. Uh, but if you put a low enough frequency and probably your dog is just angry at you when you're listening to music because they're listening to something completely different because they can hear those lower frequencies, which we don't care about and the manufacturers don't care about. Go ahead. Uh, on the exams, are we going to be given any sort of formula to be so actually I posted some previous exams. So you have access to what we've given in the past. Uh, at this point, I posted them last night. Uh, and I think other professors will post them relatively soon. So we usually wait till a couple of weeks before the exam to post ex practice exams. So you have, you will have an idea, but effectively you're just gonna get like the ID at cutoff, ID at saturation and ID at the, uh, triode region, you're not going to get any of the inequalities. Uh, that's all the equations you'll get likely about. Okay. Uh, what else is there? Okay. So is this mid frequency model pretty clear to everyone? Okay. I'm going to very rapidly go over an example, uh, but just uh, so you know, here are kind of the final results of these slides. 
So you can actually find the Tau GS, Tau GD, um, and uh, here are some estimates for the actual values for these things, just based on the order of resistance that are typically used for these circuits. Um, and yeah, and then once you have the two tau's, you can find the omega h by simply one over the addition of the two. Okay, so let's start with this. So I was initially just going to give you the small signal model, but a lot of you are having trouble with this. So I'm just going to work it through this with you. So to get these, the AC or small signal model, what do you do to the DC sources? Yeah, so you short them. So this voltage source here is really plus minus and then a ground. So then this becomes ground and so does this one. So, okay, so we shorted the sources. Now, what do we do to capacitors? Yeah, so we short capacitors for the mid frequency or small signal model. Okay. Um, I, so there are no inductors here, but if we had inductors, does everyone know what we, we would do with the inductors? Yeah, we open them. So if you didn't know that, if there are any inductors in the circuit, you open them. Uh, this might become a question in the exam at some point. So you just need to know this, even though we don't really uh, do any examples, because in this class, we actually never solve a circuit with an inductor as part of the amplifier. But we do tell you, you open inductors. OK. OK, so now that we have this, we have to draw our small signal model. And in this case, the source is grounded. So I'm just going to draw my source terminal at the bottom. And then the input is actually the gate. So I'm just going to draw the gate here. And the output is the drain. OK. So at this point, where in what direction should the current, the voltage dependent current source point to the left, to the right, down or up? Down. down, exactly. So the voltage dependent current source always points from the drain to the source. So no matter how I label these terminals, this arrow will always point from D to S. So if I wrote this circuit model as and labeled this as S and D and G down here, then my source would be pointing to the left. So this is these two things are the same. I just basically flip the wires around because see the source is to the left, whereas here it's down here. The drain is to the right. The drain is up here. But you see that the arrow points between the drain and the source in both cases. That clear? Yeah. Does anyone not understand the circuit at the bottom? Okay, cool. All right. Uh, we technically have to include here the little arrow, but for these, remember, we're ignoring them, so we're assuming that little arrow is infinite. Okay. Uh, so now let's go terminal by terminal. So here's the drain. So what is the drain connected to? Okay, so it's connected to RD. And then what other resistor is it connected to? RL, okay. And then what are RD and RL connected to? So you see RD is connected to the drain and then it's connected to, yeah, so it's connected to ground. So we're gonna connect it to ground, which is the source. And then we're gonna connect this to ground. So there, okay, so we finished that branch. See, there's two things and they're both connected to ground. So in this circuit, they're both connected to ground. So there's no real magic here. Um, so now I'm gonna go to the next terminal. What is this RSS connected to? Yeah, so this RSS is technically connected to ground on one terminal, RSS, and then on the other terminal is also connected to ground. And so what do we call it when a resistor is connected uh, to a zero, in parallel with a zero resistance, that resistor is shorted. So that means that we don't even have to draw it. Does that make sense? Okay, so now at this point we're done with the source. So now we go to the gate. Oh, 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 oh. Oops. 
that's my cue that something bad is about to happen. Okay, so what if we go to the gate? Cool. All right, uh, so yeah, so if we go to the gate, now we have a connection between R2 and ground, right? So R2 and then R1 and ground. And now we go to the source and then we have R sig and V sig. R sig. And then that's it. That's our small signal model. So I think by the end of today, you need to understand this, like you really do. Like this is the kind of uh, the goal for this week. Next, by the end of next week, you should understand the low and high frequency. Go ahead. Well, this is a homework problem. So we're given really large values of R1 and R2 such that you can essentially disclude them from the entirely. Is that possible? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So by design, you know, this R sig is like a, a nonsense parameter of the V of the input voltage source. And so an engineer kind of like, if they want to make good money, they're going to make this R sig very small. Uh, they're going to make it 10 ohms, five ohms, because that's really, the smaller this R sig, the more you pay basically. Uh, that's a good quality source. And then these R1 and R2, well, these R1 and R2, the whole sole purpose is to make this voltage a certain value because it's a voltage divider and that's how you're controlling the ID going through the, and so, you really don't want this thing at drawing current because it's just going to be wasted electricity. And so a engineer to save on electricity just makes these very high so that very little current is drawn on the left terminal. So by design, this R1 and R2 will be very high and this R6 will be very low. That being said, high resistance are uh, expensive. And so if you buy a knock off the device and they're trying to like shave off every penny so that they can sell it to you cheaper, this resistance will be low. Um, but if you're buying good quality products, this will always be high. <laughs> so, so there's engineering that goes into it, but yeah, ideally you always try to make these R1 and R2 very high to the point where really that little, that input loss of gain is negligible. Okay, so... That's okay. So now we have our small signal model. Now we're going to do the high frequency analysis, which to be honest, it's the same as last lecture. So there's really not much here. So here's what the circuit would look at high frequency, but we're looking at it from the mid frequency range. And so we're just going to look at the Thevenin resistance looking into this terminal while leaving this one open. Alternatively, if we were looking at it from the viewpoint of high frequency, we would look at the Thevenin resistance of this terminal while making this capacitor unopen. So you could do it either way, either insert both capacitance as an open one or start from the mid frequency and then just uh, look at the Thevenin resistance. Both are of course the same thing. It's just, you're looking at the same thing from the left or you're looking at the same thing from the right. Cool, so let's do that. So let's find the Thevenin resistance across VGS. So here, I uh, I will uh, insert a plus minus VGS, sorry, VX. So this is a, and then there's gonna be an IX coming out. And uh, I short out all external sources because I'm finding a Thevenin resistance. So now we need to find our Thevenin GS. Uh, can anyone off the top of my head tell me what R Thevenin is before I even do it, the loop? Yes? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But to do that, we can actually just look at this nodal equation. So let's see what we get. So Ix is coming in, right? So negative Ix. And then we have a, a Vx over R2 plus Vx over R2. That's the current going down this terminal. Is that cool? Yeah, okay. So now we have here Vx over R1. And then uh, here we have Vx 
over R sig. And those are all the currents at the node, so they have to add up to zero. And so then we say that uh, one over R1 plus one over R2 plus one over R sig Vx equals Ix. And then you actually get that uh, Vx over Ix equals one over R1 plus one over R2 plus one over R sig to the negative one, which is equal to R T H G S. So that's R seven and uh, for the, across the gate to source capacitor. So is this, oh, go ahead. We just get some terms sort of um, the small signal model and the mid frequency model are the same thing? Yes. So there's two assumptions. You're at the small signal and you're at the low uh, middle frequency. Yeah. Wait, so when you say there's two assumptions, is there such thing as like a small signal and a high frequency model? Yeah, the high frequency, sorry, the, yeah, there's a small signal high frequency model that would be including the two capacitors. We just don't analyze that. We only care about when is our assumption valid. That's it. But small signal does not necessarily only correlate to the frequency, correct? No, they're all, they're all, all three of them are small signal. All three of them, yeah. It's just that uh, here we're only analyzing the mid frequency, but we also, we don't just want to know uh, the solution to that circuit. We also want to know when that solution is valid. We actually don't care about what the solution to the circuit is or what the solution is to the low frequency circuit. We just care about when is it valid, when is our middle one valid? That's all we care about. So when we say high frequency analysis, we're really not doing high frequency analysis. We're just trying to figure out when our mid frequency breaks down. Yeah. So basically just, uh, I, I guess some of you are gonna be very happy. Some of you maybe are sad, but this is our last lecture on transistor. <laughs> so it's over. <laughs> So yeah, so all you need to know is everything about the mid frequency, when it's valid, and <laughs> all right, sorry, I should keep going. I'm wasting too much time. <laughs> okay, okay, so okay, so now let's look at this uh, CGD. So now you basically to find the now you need to find the R seven and across this capacitor. So you do the exact same thing. You just basically insert a plus minus V X. And this one actually is kind of a, not a very, it's not a really a fun circuit to solve. So in particular, you have uh, two nodal equations. So you're gonna have a nodal equation where I X comes here. And so you're gonna have basically V, da, 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 oh God, V X. So you're gonna have basic, if you do the nodal equation here, you're gonna have Ix negative plus Vx divided by, does anyone know? Yeah, oh yeah, divided by R sig or R1, R sig. And then you're gonna have plus Vx over R1 plus Vx over R2. And that has to be all equal to zero. Um, wait, is that Vx? Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. This is Vgs, because that's the voltage between here and here. Sorry, Vgs, Vgs, Vgs. And then you basically do a little bit of algebra and then you're gonna get that V, oh God. VGS equals R sig in parallel to R1 in parallel to R2. Uh, the, sorry, uh, yeah, IX. Yeah, so it's that clear how I got from like one to the other without doing the algebra. 
Okay. Alternatively, I could have just comp I just could have just done the the equivalent resistance of these three, which is R sig, and then gone directly for it. Okay. So we have one equation, and then we have to do this node all equation, which uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna just show you in the next slide. So now for this thing, we have basically IX is coming into this terminal. So we're gonna have IX coming out of this node. And then we have GM, VGS coming out of this node. And then we have VDS over RD in parallel with RL. Uh, and then we can basically do some algebra and then since here we know that VGS equals this IX, we actually can just plug this into VGS for VGS. And now we have an equation in terms of VDS and uh, and uh, IX. And then how did I get rid of the VDX? Mm -hmm. GM, yeah, so here's our sig, ix, and then this. Oh, yeah, so to get rid of this VDS, then I had to basically do all this like maneuvering, which basically I said Vx is actually VGD, which is the voltage between the grain and the drain. But then you also know that VGS is just VGD minus VSD. Uh, that's just uh, algebraically because VGD is just VG minus VD, VSD is just VS minus VD, and so the VDs cancel and you get VGS. So then you can say that VGS is just VX minus VSD, or VDS is equal VGS minus VX, and so then you can just plug this into here, do a bunch of maneuvering, and then you get this equation here. And then you basically solve it. I mean, at this point, it's a lot of algebra. Um, you need to actually just practice a lot of this. The important thing is that you need to you need to get from this class is to set them up. But uh, problem solving is something that you uh, kind of have to do on your own. I really, it's like going to the gym. I can't if I if you go if I'm like your personal trainer and I'm like lifting a lot of weight for you, you your muscles are not going to grow. Like it's just not. I mean, I can yeah. Go ahead. What do you mean a different source? No, so before we were trying to find the Thevenin resistance across here, and that's why the source was across there. So we were looking for our Thevenin and GS, but now we're looking for our Thevenin GD. So that's why we have to put the source here, because we're looking at the the Thevenin resistance across this terminal. So we need to find both Thevenin resistances. There's two separate ones. Does that make sense or no? So basically, where there is two capacitors, and each of them have their own time constant. And so we're trying to find both time constants. And to do that, we need to first find uh, the Thevenin resistance of one of them so that then we can multiply by CGS to get the time constant of this capacitor. But then there's another capacitor. So now we need to find the Thevenin resistance of this terminal and then multiply by this other capacitance to get the second uh, time constant of the circuit. And there's always two for each circuit. So that's why here there's two of them. But the actual omega i is actually one over the sum of these two time constants. Yeah, because the algebra is just like. Yeah. No, 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 no. We didn't get the same answer. We just, I just didn't solve it. I'm just lazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The answer is, uh, the answer is actually right here. 
I think this is one of the more complicated ones, and that's why the book actually goes over it. Uh, the the first one was kind of like a nice little example, which I I liked. I, I liked, but the second, yeah. It's just, but yeah, so we continue doing that for the drain, the source. So I have a question for all of you. Do you want me to go over one more of these, or do you want me to go over a small signal, the small signal one we didn't go over the previous lecture? So raise your hands, I guess. More high frequency, more small signal. I guess more high frequency hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. How about mo more small signal? Three, four, five, six. Oh, got it. <laughs> I really dislike you all. <laughs> all right, we have 10 minutes, so I'm just going to go over. What happened? No. What do you like? Seriously, uh, I guess from a show of hand, who understands most signal analysis? I like, be honest, you know, like. Like, you, I, feel like, I feel like the high is pretty it's actually pretty good. <laughs> Sorry. No, this is this is no, this is true. You know, I, I come here, I do lectures, everyone like it's always the same students answering. So I have this like skewed view of reality. And I'm just like, oh, these students are awesome. Yeah. And then I get the test back and I'm just like, oh, I suck at teaching. Like <laughs> So you all create this like fantasy, but then eventually I have to like traverse that fantasy. So <laughs> this is all your fault. <laughs> so, okay, I'll stop wasting time. I'm just going to go to that frequency. <laughs> all right, so here's the common drain. So the very first thing we have to do is just find the small signal circuit and apparently a good 70% of you know how to get here, so. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so now at this point, we have our small signal frequency and we're trying to actually predict omega high. But to predict that omega high, we first need to find R theven in across the uh, gate and the drain. And we also have to find R theven in across the gate and the source. And then, uh, once we find that R7 and across the gate and the drain and the gate and the source, uh, we can actually find our time constant. So actually, I these capacitances C, G, D, and C, G, S will be given to you as part of the transistor uh, specification. So these are things that you already know. So you're never solving for these C, G, Ds or C, G, S. So you just assume you know those. So really what you're trying to find is this R7 because then you multiply by C and then you're going to get your, uh, you're going to get your tau and then G D and then G D and then you're going to multiply this one by C and then you're going to get your tau G S R G S. And so, uh, yeah, so C and then this is tau. Okay. So, all you're looking for is R7 and that's it. Like the, the rest is just multiply that by capacitance and then take one over tau GD plus tau GS. All of the work is this. Okay, so now let's let's just find one of these really quickly. And I guess, can anyone just tell me what tau, let's say I do a BX test, IX. So because I'm finding a Thevenin in resistance, I have to short all out exterior sources. So here's Vx and here's Ix. So what is the uh, Thevenin in resistance looking from the gate and the drain, sorry? Because yeah, so you're gonna have basically, these three are in parallel. So then you have a KCL loop that is basically negative Ix plus Vx divided by R sig in parallel to R1 in parallel to R2. And so that you can find the ratio of V sig and R sig to this. Is that clear to everyone? So, you know, these, these things are actually like difficult from, in my opinion, not really from a conceptual end. They're actually difficult from a arithmetic problem solving end. Like 
for example, we're gonna do the next one now and it's like, have fun basically. Uh, but it is what it is, you know, you just need practice. It's, it's all just practice. All right, so now let's do this one. So we have here plus minus dx ix. So now we're gonna basically have to do this loop and I don't even know if I can do this. Okay, let's see. ix is coming in and then we have negative gm dgs. And then we have here that uh, this is open because this was our O, but we said we're ignoring our O to simplify the analysis, although I don't think it really does anything. Uh, yeah, plus. And Wait, what am I adding? What's the current from here to here? Does anyone know or no? Uh, what is the current coming down here? Yeah, so you have here VS and here you have VD. So you have VSD divided by RSS parallel with RL. So kind of these two currents, and then that should be equal to zero. Okay, so one thing here is, does anyone, can anyone uh, tell me what VGS is? Huh? Not quite, but yeah. So if you look at here, the negative terminal is connected backwards. So actually VGS is equal to negative VX. And so we can already get rid of this, but now we need to worry about this SD. So one thing to note is that uh, in this particular case, we need another loop. So we're gonna have to basically do another loop here, sorry, another node, Ix. And so in that particular one, we can actually say that, uh, so this is the node and then Ix is coming out of here. So we have Ix plus, da, da, da. D, G, D divided by R sig in parallel to R1 in parallel to R2 equals zero. Uh, yeah, so that now we have these two equations, uh, but D, G, D, what's another way to write V, G, D? V, G, S minus D, D, S. And so we can actually plug in VX for VGS. And now we have three variables. And so now we just do another substitution and then boom, the thing just breaks down. So basically you take this VGS, you write this as VGS minus, or VX, negative VX minus VDS. You move the VDS term to one side and then you substitute back into this equation. And then the, then it's just a, a little bit of algebra and boom, it just, and that's what I did here. So first I got the green node equation, which I wrote in the previous slide, the, uh, sorry, the purple one, and then the green one. From the purple one, you can basically come up with this, but then you also know that VGD is equal to VG, uh, uh, that VSD is actually equal to VGD minus uh, VX. And so here you just plug in VGD, in this form, and then now you can basically plug this back in for this, and then do a lot of uh, maneuvering to get it to this form. Um, yeah, so that's how you solve these uh, circuit problems. And then I also did the common gate, but I think we're out of time. But I guess one last minute questions. We have one minute. Let's go ahead. Yeah, so you're just trying to find omega low, omega high. That's what we call high frequency analysis. That's it.